Uh, we're from the Parallel Programming Lab at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, UIUC. Uh, this is Phil Miller. He's a grad student in the lab, and I'm Ram, Ram Prasad Venkataraman. Uh, I'm a research staff member in the lab. Uh, the lead group lead is uh, Professor Sanjay Kale. It's a long name again. Uh, so uh, let's see. Before starting, we decided to cut out a lot of, the, lot of the introduction because you guys have already seen it before yesterday in Dan Quinlan's keynote and this morning in uh, Hartmut's uh, talk about HPX. Uh, the, the bottom line there uh, is that architectural trends uh, will mean that everybody has to worry about parallelism, concurrency, uh, and about scaling. Uh, it's not just enough if you're, if you're running on a quad core or an eight core now and you, can, you cannot rest easy saying, okay, I've, I've scaled to eight cores and that's good enough because trends will mean that uh, chips are not getting any faster. You're only going to keep adding more cores to your, uh, to your hardware. Uh, but internet in, in, interconnect latencies or, or memory, memory latencies and bandwidths are not keeping up uh, with the number of cores that are being added. So the same problem that runs on four cores today uh, will will need will will be, will have to deal with more cores tomorrow for the same problem size and the same memory memory bandwidths and access latencies. Uh, so strong scaling and scaling in general and parallel programming and performance is of is of concern to everybody. Uh, we come from uh, a very different community than than the the cutting edge C plus plus boost library developer community that 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 I found here. Uh, so we come from an HPC community where we cater to computational science and HPC scientific applications. Uh, and we've done, I think we've done a good job of that in the last couple of decades. Chum++ is about 20 years old, uh, but we'll probably go more into that uh, as we get in. Uh, so, here you go. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so just before we really dive into the content, I want to start off with a quick audience poll. So who here has written a parallel program, first of all, or written a program to run in parallel? OK, just about everyone. Okay. Great. Uh, so who here has experienced some sort of bad scaling, where you run one more cores and you stop getting more performance? OK, pretty much. Yeah, and if you've not, you've not pushed it far enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. How about sad scaling, where you add more cores and performance <laughs> actually gets worse? Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, the rest of you are re very lucky. Okay. Or you've done a very good job. I'm impressed. Um, okay. So just going to check on other things you might have encountered in the process of writing parallel programs. So races, deadlocks, or other gremlins of shared state parallel programming. How many of you have run into those sorts of things? You know, P threads, locks, mutexes, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't going to, you know, impugn the audience's honesty. Maybe you're just not listening to the questions. Um, so how many of you have written parallel programs that are limited to just one kind of system, just shared memory parallelism, just GPUs, or, you know, MPI, for instance, where you can't share memory because everything is separate processes? Does vectorization count as a separate system? Um, depends what kind of vectorization. SIMD, I mean, that's limited to just one one processor, one set of processors. Yeah. So yeah, SIMD would, yeah, and yeah, and you get to redo that for that every core. Um, so what about uh, code written to match the number of cores you plan to run on? So you know, MPI, you know, com ranks would would count for that. P thread num cores. Okay. Um, how about code that's written in a way that? Uh, independent tasks are either serialized or they have to be, you know, hard divided across the execution resources. Okay. Yeah, a couple still. Um, how many of you have interwoven, you know, the optimizations and specification of parallel tuning into the application logic? Okay. That's... People are <laughs> you almost still have getting there. You get some performance out of it. Yeah. Um, how many of you have worried about wasted energy in your parallel programs? Colombia in the US. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right now. <laughs> okay. So what I can promise you is that what you'll hear about Charm Plus Plus will address all of these points. Oh yeah. And one last one. Um, how many of you how many of you have written or tried to write parallel programs that end up with square peg logic in you know, round hole frameworks, where you just had the wrong abstractions for what you were trying to do. Um, the example I usually like to pull out for this is writing like tightly coupled scientific applications in MapReduce, for instance. 
doesn't seem to work out quite well for people. So, okay. uh, so charm, uh, charm plus plus is 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 we think it's many things. Uh, so it's a down. That's down. Okay, so it's a it's a programming model, meaning it's a it's a way to it's a way to think about parallelism and to express and design your parallel algorithms. Uh, it's also a programming framework which helps you actually express or realize that design or that parallel algorithm in actual code. Uh, and it's towards the protector. Ah, it's IR. Okay, yeah. and it's a runtime system, uh, which uh, which actually takes the program that you've written and actually tries to extract good performance out of it when you're executing it on, par on, on parallel or distributed or shared memory systems. Uh, so again, I should remember that. Uh, it's general purpose, meaning it's, it's not a specific framework to solve a specific class of problems or something. Uh, we believe it can express truly general, uh, a broad spectrum of parallel algorithms. Uh, so you should be able to find it uh, fits your needs if, if you have any interest in parallel algorithms. Um, it's, it's a macro data flow system, uh, meaning, uh, okay, maybe we should go into that later, but, but, uh, but the way of expressing algorithms is based on dependencies, and we, we, express, dip, we express data flow, uh, large scale or medium grained data flow, and not fine grained stuff. Uh, it's a unified data and task parallelism model. Uh, it, it can handle both data parallelism, task parallelism, in a, in a kind of seamless manner. We don't really distinguish very hardly between these two. Uh, it's... It, it, it handles shared and distributed memory systems. It runs on both across the spectrum of things. We run on your laptop. We run on the largest supercomputers in the world. Uh, so that so we're, we're pretty scale, we're portable in terms of that size and scale. Uh, and and the model as such is is built around the notion of expressing your algorithm completely independent of the number of processors that you have available. Uh, you probably heard that theme repeated uh, earlier this morning in the HPX talk. Uh, and uh, it provides seam. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, uh, it provides seamless parallel composability of modular components, uh, and meaning. Uh, okay. We will explain when we get to the slide. Okay. So I don't want to spend too much time here. We can just probably just yeah. keep going. Uh, the framework, as such, is um, well. Well, it, it it has its origin many origins many years ago. So it's it's built around a code generator. Uh, and it provides base classes that you inherit from, that your application inherits from. It has a bunch of utility functions and other API that you can use to write or express your parallel programs. Uh, it's multi-paradigm parallel code, uh, meaning you can write procedural, object-oriented, generic code, uh, and you can have that run on multiple processors. Uh, so, so we don't tie you to one way of doing things. Uh, and it's got a rich ecosystem of tools. It's got a parallel debugger. It's got a complete performance an analysis and visualization, visualization toolkit. Uh, and uh, it separates rules and concerns uh, between different people involved in the whole process of software development, especially large-scale parallel pro software development. Uh, the runtime system provides managed parallel execution, uh, which is different from uh, the MPI-like, library-like uh, mechanism where you, you just get, you're just given communication primitives and you have to write your whole parallel uh, algorithm and your program and manage everything yourself. Instead, here we actually have a runtime system that manages execution for you. Uh, it orchestrates parallel, ex uh, parallel execution. We'll go, to go into this in some more detail uh, shortly. Uh, it provides measurement-based performance introspection, uh, meaning if you're running your parallel program, uh, the runtime system can observe its performance for you, um, and it can, it can learn from what's happening there, and it can, it can adaptively respond to any changes in the execution scenario to provide better performance. Uh, and this adaptive response includes fault tolerance. Uh, so, so I'm listing features here which are in production releases of Charm. Uh, so fault tolerance meaning you could, you could kill an in a process or you could pull the plug on a node or something, uh, but typically the application would continue to execute. Uh, it can roll back from checkpoints or it, it's got in-memory checkpointing and a couple of different schemes. Uh, so this, this is probably more relevant um, as, as large-scale parallel systems get bigger and bigger, right? Uh, it's got dynamic load balancing. Uh, meaning, once you express your algorithm, uh, if your algorithm has any dynamic changes in it, which typically happens in complex physics applications that we usually cater to, or many other applications, uh, if you've got any load imbalances, if you've got any changes in the application, or if you've got changes in the execution scenario, if you've got OS noise, jitter, uh, those kind of situations, it can dynamically adapt to these situations and provide load balance for better performance. Uh, and more recently, we've been working on uh, 
energy management in, in the execution environment. Uh, and we'll talk more about that soon. Uh, and hand over again. Yep. And, and we're trying to do this quick handover just so that you don't hear one voice and, and start getting drowsy. Oh, yeah. Can you turn on my purple lights, please? Oh. Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Rum, oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Are we not visible? You're good now. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so just to give you a sense of uh, what kind of systems Charm++ will run on, we span basically the whole range of computers, excepting maybe like microcontrollers that run your washing machine. Um, so embedded ARM systems, including the Karma development board that NVIDIA is shipping, uh, cell phones, we've had someone in the group you know, bring up their Android phone with Charm applications running on it. Uh, commodity x86 machines, so every laptop in this room can run Charm and you know, all of your desktop, servers, whatever. Um, clusters, which would be you know, the same commodity processors but with some sort of net common network connecting them, Ethernet, InfiniBand, that kind of thing. And then also the largest supercomputers in the world of the sort that uh, IBM and Cray sell. So what we've shown here are um, an IBM Blue Gene Q, I believe this is the installation at Argonne National Lab, uh, Mira, and Titan, which is the giant Cray system at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, so we run across basically any OS you could want to run Charm on. Uh, so Linux, Mac OS, Windows, various proprietary Cray and IBM kernels. Uh, I think I lumped Aches under there as well. We have supported that. Um, we support you know, a huge number of network interfaces you know, driving the network natively, so TCP and UDP for you know, Ethernet kind of settings. Shared memory when you're running on a multi-core system, and even when you have multi-core nodes connected by a network, the nodes in common can use shared memory to communicate. MPI, we can build on top of MPI, so any place you have a cluster that already has MPI running, you can just use that rather than configure to match the native network. So InfiniBand verbs, very common interconnect for people who want to build a cluster that goes a little faster than Ethernet. And then the network, the proprietary networks that are more tightly coupled on high-end supercomputers. So your blue jeans and your Cray kind of systems. And we also are portable across a, frankly, rather painful set of compilers. Um, some of these we've heard, you know, lots of discussion of very good support for recent C++ standards. Um, some of them, especially when you get towards the end, that end of the list, are not so friendly on keeping up with the standard and uh, providing all of the features we want. And because we have users that you know depend on each of these compilers, we're you know we kind of have to keep ourselves to a safe uh, intersection of the features that they provide. Um, so just to give you a little bit of sense of history of Charm Plus Plus. Uh, it was, the project was started in the late 1980s based on ideas inspired by the ReadyFlow system, Actor as an ABCL. So the char kernel was developed initially out of work on Parallel Prolog. And then in a few years later, in 92, an initial C++ version that eventually became known as Charm++ was developed. Um, in 94 to 96, our kind of flagship application, NAMD, was written and uh, started to scale. At the time, it was far and away the most scalable molecular dynamics code you know, in the market, and I believe still is. Um, and in the few years since then, we've adapted additional abstractions to make writing parallel programs easier. We've added an implementation of MPI that we call adaptive MPI on top of the Charm++ runtime system. So even existing MPI codes can get some of the benefits of running a Charm++ program. And in the last decade and a half, we've developed additional applications, expanded the runtime facilities that ship with Charm++, and scaled all of that to you know, the full sizes of many new machines. So, and that work has netted us a few prizes. So the Gordon Bell Prize in 2002 for NAMD, the HPC Challenge Award in 2011, which focuses on a combination of parallel performance and productivity, usually measured by looking at the code and deciding how much the judges like it. Um, and uh, the Sidney Fernbach Prize for uh, Professor Kale, our advisor and uh, one of our collaborators, and a handful of best paper awards for various things we've done using Charm. 
So um, basically, the expression of parallelism in Charm++ is designed to be independent of the number of processors that you're running your program on. So instead, we encourage application developers to use natural units that match the problem domain you're working in. So this probably sounds a lot like object-oriented programming in general, if that's the way that, you, that you're inclined. So if you're writing some kind of numerical linear algebra algorithm frequently, you would write uh, matrix blocks as the unit of parallelism in the program. If you were doing image processing, you know, chunks of the image or something like that might be. If you had, you know, some other kind of computation, you might slice up the work in, you know, along natural boundaries. And similarly, for other, for other kinds of problems, you can usually find a natural mapping from the problem domain to a division of the problem domain to parallel units of work. Yeah, and, oh, yeah. And so generally, you know, whatever those units of parallelism that you have, um, you would express those as objects that contain or that represent part of the problem to be solved. Is this uh, cut? Yeah, yeah, we're going to keep showing images like this where, where when we, I think each of these boxes is going to be an object. Uh, so when we're trying to discuss or dis uh, explain what, we, what, what the scheme is about, typically colors will represent objects of the same class. Uh, or objects of the same instance or something like that. Wait, right. is this still mine? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, if you have a problem that you want to do purely data parallel you know, design, uh, you would basically create a, an indexed collection of objects, so the equivalent of an array in a sequential program, and you would just have you know, one name that refers to a whole set of these things that you can index you know, in a structured manner. If you have... Um, you know, more complexity in your problem, you might end up with two separate collections that would have their own index spaces and, you know, separate names. And if you have a work-based decomposition of a parallel problem or, you know, what might be called task parallelism, then you could actually subdivide parts of the computation among different objects. So this is, you know, the very common Fibonacci example where you start off with, you know, Fibonacci of five at the root of this computation tree and then you spawn separate objects to execute distinct parts of the parallel computation and you end up with, you know, a sequential execution below some threshold for efficiency. Um, so one thing to note about this style of design is that the parallel design where you write different parts of your computation in different classes so that you can generate parallelism out of them also means that you end up with a clean functional decomposition in the source code that you write. So if you write multiple classes to express multiple kinds of parallelism in your program, that also means that you can maintain those separate classes independently and people working on them won't interfere with each other. You know, they're well encapsulated, so one class doesn't need to know the implementation details of another to interact with it in parallel or sequentially. Um, so, in general, uh, yeah. in, in general, the application logic then gets expressed via collection, classes and collections of instances of those classes that will interact in ways that Rom will tell you about. Uh, okay, so I don't know if, if everybody's asleep or if, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we'll take questions at any point, so yeah. feel free to interrupt us rather than just getting lost and then, you know, tuning out for the rest okay. of the talk. And then we, we want to hear from you. We want to know what you're interested in hearing about. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so, so far we've, we've spoken about, okay, uh, how you can express your, your algorithm in terms of objects and class collections. Uh, so you can have this application with multiple uh, multiple collections of objects, uh, and uh, but we haven't spoken about parallelism yet. We haven't spoken about concurrency. How do you how do you run this on a on a system with many processors or many cores? Uh, ideally, what you uh, ideally what you'd want the system to do uh, is actually distribute this collection of objects across the processors, right? Uh, so so that's the uh, that's the only way you can actually exploit all the hardware that's available. Uh, but you don't want to burden the programmer with this view. Right? Uh, you don't want the programmer to know that some objects live on some other processor and you have to deal with it. Uh, because ideally, you want the programmer to natively think about 
the application or the parallelism in terms of the applications units, not the fact that there are so many processors and you have to talk to something on some other processor. Um, so uh, we solve that by elevating some of these objects uh, into a globally visible object space. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's what we represented here with this rectangle that's spanning all these processors. Actually, the colors are completely gone, washed out. Uh, so, <laughs> right. uh, so, so yeah, so the dashed rectangle, uh, all the objects within this space are the ones that are globally visible, meaning that they can be accessed or addressed uh, from any processor in your system, in your parallel program. Uh, the ones that are outside are not. Uh, so that's the distinction we make. Uh, and we leave this responsibility of uh, specifying which ones have to be globally visible to the application developer, because the application developer is the one who knows best about the algorithm and about the problem that they are trying to solve, he or she is trying to solve. Right? Um, so what we call, okay, so we should probably just introduce some very brief terminology. Uh, so the objects which are globally visible, we call them chars, and, and that, that has some etymology origin from uh, old Middle English or something where a chore or something is, is a piece of work. Um, so I think it, it derives from that. Uh, so a piece of work or an object in this, in this parallel program would be a char. Uh, and object collections, whether they're for data parallelism or work decomposition or functional parallelism, but object collections, meaning, meaning a collection of instant, a, a vector of objects, if you will, or an array of objects uh, are called char arrays. Uh, these are dynamic instances. These are not like static collections of objects. You can add and remove from these collections of objects at any time during runtime. Um, and, and that's the terminology we have. Um, so, okay, syntax. Here, there you go. Yeah. Okay, uh, question, Dave. Question. Even though they're <coughs> globally visible, they're still distributed across the different oh, processor no. memory? Uh, yes, yeah, so they're, they are distributed across the different processor memories. You're and, oh yeah, the question was, um, even though they're, the objects are globally visible, are they distributed across memory? And the way we handle that is we treat, at the baseline level of the API, we treat each object as its own locality domain. And when you're programming, ac you know, access to any other object is treated as a remote operation to encourage you know, a focus on locality while the programmer is writing their code. So that, you know, to minimize latencies and overheads that might be introduced by accident. Um, but the notion of whether, whether a process or whether an object is on the same processor or a remote processor is handled by the runtime code. Bryce? Do you uh, have any sort of memory management for um, globally visible objects? So the question is, do we have uh, memory management for globally visible objects? And the answer to that is uh, we have explicit management where objects can be created and destroyed explicitly. And generally, the structure of Charm++ programs to date has largely been either that the objects are created at startup and persist to the end of the program, so there's no real you know, memory management for objects to be dealt with, or the objects have a very distinct lifetime that you can tell when it's dead and it can be explicitly deleted. Other questions so far? Okay, so just to give you a taste of the syntax for how this works. Um, so as described earlier, we have a little bit of a code generator to provide the infrastructure for parallel interaction among the objects. And that code wor generator works on what we call CI files, which is, stands for charm interface. Uh, so the declaration, you wrap you know, pieces of the CI file in this module thing, which determines where, what headers, various bits of generated code get placed in. And then within those modules, you include declarations of individual char types, so arrays of chars or individual chars or things like that. And so in the headers for your classes then, when you declare them, there's a small reference to inherit from this generated C-base class to, in, you know, to bring pieces of the parallel infrastructure into your local scope and to carry a little bits of state that the runtime needs about each object. And in the implementation file, you write your class exactly as you normally would and you include this generated file, the def.h file, that provides implementations for parts of the interface that just needs to be compiled in with the rest of the program. So the way the compilation works is you start off with the interface file 
You pass that through our compiler wrapper, which also handles portability issues across the many compilers that Charm++ runs on. So your build files are generally, your make files or whatever other scripts you have can be uniform across platforms. Um, that generates the decal and def files. And then you have you know, your own application header and your application source, which includes the headers, the generated code, and you then compile that and you get an object file out that you can link as normally. Uh, question? The, the generated files, are yes. they unreadable or are they? Um, for the initiated, they're quite readable. Oh, okay. um, I in general, I mean, they're, they're fairly regular in structure. We probably could abstract parts of what's generated into uh, generic code that would you know, not require text duplication but the instances would still be duplicated in the binary. Um, so we might be able to simplify our code generator with the trade-off of adding a whole bunch of generic code in, you know, the, in the runtime. Another question? Do you ever have to um, hand write those generated files or hand modify them like for a really complex project, um, like something like NAMD, do you ever have a situation where you need to Okay, so the question was, do we ever need to hand hack the generated files to match the needs of particularly complex projects um, with the p potential example of NAMD? So uh, in general, no. We, any, we consider any possible need to hand hack those generated files as a bug in the code generator and we go fix it. Um, in NAMD's case, NAMD actually hasn't really jumped on every new feature in Charm. It's kind of stuck kept itself at older points in the API. So it, it has imposed very light requirements on what we do to the rest of the system. Some newer applications that make heavier use of templates and inheritance have required exploring what the generated files need to look like so that we could fix the generator. It's one of the benefits of having commit rights to the whole tool chain, right? So, so if something's wrong with the code generation, we actually go fix it. Yeah. Um, other questions at that point? No. Okay. Uh, so. The, so you saw that in our declaration we have this array notation and it calls itself 2D you know, for two-dimensional. Uh, arrays of chars can be you know, multi-dimensional from one to six dimensions. The collections can be dense, meaning the index space is fully populated, or they can be sparse, meaning only particular elements within the space of indices actually are instantiated. Um, we can also, instead of having, you know, a small set of ints to indicate which char in a collection you want to talk to, you can use you know, hashable objects of any sort, strings, bit vectors, various other things like that. Um, and these collections can be static or dynamic, meaning that you can create a collection of chars all in one shot, or you can create chars and delete them as your application runs to suit the needs of execution at any given time. So to describe one, one application that makes very you know, heavy use of char arrays, Ram's going to tell you about OpenAtom, which he's worked on substantially. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is just for a change of pace. Uh, so this is one, this is an act, actually one of, the, one of the big applications that runs in Jump++. Uh, it's a quantum chemistry application used for material design. Uh, people explore, use it to explore like next generation semiconductor materials and devices and device electronics and things like that. Uh, so it was built ground up for really fine grained parallelization. Uh, and by that I mean really strong scaling. Uh, they want to study these small molecular systems uh, with a few atoms or a few molecules in them. And they want to be able to do it really, really quickly. They want really quick turnaround in whatever simulations or experiments they're running. Uh, so we built this for strong scaling, uh, meaning what we did was we tried to decompose the application logic uh, into as, we tried to express as much parallelism as, as we could. Uh, typically what happens is in a simple data decomposition, at least quantum chemistry applications other than open atom, uh, they take a molecular system, uh, there are lots of electrons in the molecular system, so each of them has electronic states. So you can only decompose your application into as many electronic states as there are in the system. So if you take like 32 molecules of water, which is, which is a silly example, uh, but if you take 32 molecules of water, you'll only have one, 128 electronic states. And they'll only run this on 128 processors at the most. So that would be their scaling limit. Because beyond that, they wouldn't be able to break up their work into finer pieces. Uh, so, so we took note of that, and we tried to decompose this in a much more fine-grained manner. 
Um, so we realized that an electronic state is not just that. Uh, we went and we, we so so it's a question. It's a question of understanding how your algorithm is is laid out, right? You you look at what matrices there are, what operations there are, what numerical computation that needs to happen. Uh, so. I won't go into the whole details, but suffice to say that there are probably uh, 12, 15 different object collections in here. Uh, computation kind of goes in phases and kind of loops through all these object arrays. Each of them gets input from something else, computes something, and then sends an output to something else. Uh, so each of these is an object collection. Uh, object collect and we have multiple instances of each of these classes. Uh, so that it, it turned out to be a very successful uh, design because uh, the same 32 molecules of water, which I said, uh, which is the red line, we were able to scale it from, we actually started at 128 processors, right? We scaled it from 128 up to 8,000 cores. Uh, and that was simply because we were really able to extract or express much more parallelism uh, than is typically done. Uh, and, and using object collections to explore, uh, to decompose your data and decompose the computations that happen on the data helped us do that. Uh, so. That was one thing I should mention here. So all of these are not just data parallel arrays, right? So some of these are actually data parallel arrays, but some of these are pure work decomposition kind of arrays. So, so if, you, if you take something in here, there's actually no state that it's holding. It's, it's basically just a worker. It's a collection of worker objects. It gets data, it does something, it sends it out again. Uh, so, so that kind of seamless data and work decomposition helps you express more parallelism in your, algor in your, in your algorithm. Right? Um, went the wrong way. Yes, question. Um, what about graph problems for a problem where I've got a data structure that's not an array that I want to distribute and work with? So, so typically graph, yeah, OK. The question is, uh, so what about graph problems? Uh, what about problems where your, your data structure or your data that you want to deal with is not an array, right? Uh, so, so, so that's the whole point about trying to find a unit of decomposition that is natural to the domain, right? Graphs can typically be partitions. You can, you can, you can take out small pieces of your graph. You can decompose your graph. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so you have, you do have tree-based recursive computations or, or, or computations like that, right? So one of the applications we work on is called JetAlloc. Uh, it's an, it's an airlift scheduling problem. Uh, so, so the. So the Department of Defense wants, runs this massive material movement uh, operation, right? And they want to optimize it. So it bas it's basically an optimization problem. Uh, and what, what happens there is you want, to, you, you want to solve this optimization problem, and it turns out to be a tree-based computation, right? Uh, so you don't have arrays over there, and you don't have a clear decomposition, which is, which is typically what the numerical or mathematical uh, domains do. Uh, so the, un the natural unit there becomes uh, one vertex of the tree-based computation. Uh, or, or a few vertices of your tree-based computation. So, so you have objects, you, have, you design classes which can hold a, a few vertices of your tree, uh, and then they compute on them, and any dependencies that go out can, can be expressed in your algorithm. And, and we, we're actually working on that. Uh, I don't think I have it in here, yeah. but it's... Uh, so that is another... So this is on... This is an, an, both of these data results are on IBM Blue Gene Q. Uh, that is a slightly bigger data set. It's actually significantly bigger data set. It's four, uh, eight times the size. And that goes all the way up to 32,000 cores. Uh, so, okay, I'll, any more questions at this point? Okay, so we still haven't really, I mean, like, hopefully people don't think we're just waving our hands, right? We've just spoken about decomposition, we're saying object collections. Uh, but we've kind of, kind of washed over one, one, in, one important thing, right? Uh, you have this collection of objects, and some of them are globally visible. Uh, but how do these objects interact? How do you actually express your algorithm? Uh, so that's, uh, in typical sequential setting, if you have an object-oriented program, and I don't have to tell this audience about how to write good software, right? You, you, would, you, would, decompose your, uh, you, you would decompose your logic, you would express interactions as methods, uh, and that's what you'd like to do, right? So if you have an object-based program, you'd, you'd, you'd like to express your interactions as, as a bunch of methods on each other. Uh, I'm only showing a subset here. Um, and that expresses your, your actual logic of what you want to do. And each object, each object exposes a behavior saying, I have this state. If you call this method on me, this is what I'm going to do. So it's kind of all a, re a reactive expression of the algorithm. And, and you chain these together to, to make the application do what you want. Uh, how do you achieve this in a, in, a, in a parallel setting, right? We want to achieve this in a parallel setting. And Charm++ actually enables you to do that. Uh, it, it, it maintains the same method invocation semantic uh, across processors. So we enable remote method invocations. Uh, 
not completely transparently because there are, we, we, have we have conscious design decisions. Uh, we enable report met method invocations, but with some modifications. Um, the f that, oh, am I talking too fast? Uh, no, too slow, if anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're well into time, okay. Um, okay, so the first, first condition is not every re object is remotely invocable. We already spoke about that. We only have some of the objects which are globally visible. And we, and we restrict global or remote method invocations only to objects which live inside this global space. Uh, no object out living outside can get an invocation from another processor. That seems pretty obvious. It's, it's, it's a braided observation. Uh, not every method is remotely invocable. You could have a class, uh, and you could have an instance of the class that lives in this global namespace. But not every method it publishes, every pub not all of its public API is remote, remotely invocable. The programmer, the application developer who knows the parallel algorithm and the logic annotates which methods shall be remotely invocable. Uh, and that, that becomes a conscious design decision. You, you decide which methods actually do enough work or enough computation to, to overcome the overhead of a remote method invocation. And that annotation comes from the application developer. Um, yes. And more syntax, and, and Phil will take over. Yep. Right. Okay. So just to get a little bit more concrete from what we've shown so far. So now that we've seen, you know, that we have remote method invocation, here's how we're going to declare it and uh, implement it. Um, oh, did I not include calls on? Oh, calls are on the next slide. Okay. So the declaration is in that same charm interface file that we talked about earlier. Um, for each class that is going to be remotely invocable, you'll then declare which methods of that class will actually have remote interfaces. So for parallel objects, you need to be able to call the constructor remotely because the runtime system needs to be able to set it up on some arbitrary processor when it's instantiated. And then you have additional methods that just declare you know, their normal signature with uh, what arguments they take. And if you're going to take arrays of data for the run that you want the runtime to marshal for you, you can actually specify Oh, I got that slightly wrong. Um, that should be the normal array position. Um, so that's an array of doubles of size count. And then in the header file, you just need to ensure that those methods are public so that the runtime system can access them. You know, we can't really do like crazy reflection things in raw C++ 98. Um, or we don't really want to try because that sounds horrendously painful. And then in the implementation file, source file, you know, you just implement them as normal. There's nothing special there. And, and before somebody feels squeezy about the, int, the, the way we're sending arrays, we can actually send vectors in all STL data structures. So, yeah. so, so we can send a standard std vector over there, so that's not an issue. Thank you. Um, okay, so then when you want to call one of these entry methods, what you do is, um, at instantiation time, you use what we call proxy object to say that first you want to instantiate a new collection of objects using this method called CKNew. Generally, uh, methods that our system provides are prefixed with CK for char kernel. And you specify the size of the array and the arguments that you want to pass to the constructor for each object. Um, and this is actually a place where we could start to adopt some C++11 features by passing an initializer list there that would distinguish which are constructor arguments fr from which are array size arguments to that CK new operation. And then when you want to call methods on that collection of objects or on instances within that collection, you, know, you can set up whatever arguments you have. And then on the proxy, if you want to reference a single object in the collection, you subscript the proxy to indicate which element within the collection you want to address, and you invoke the method on it, exactly you, as you would if you just had a reference to the object locally. Um, so, and we, we explicitly go kind of the opposite direction for many other RMI implementations, generally in more like server implementation, distributed system kind of things, where you want to hide the fact that calls are remote to make programming easier. Um, in our setting, we actually want to call attention to the remote method invocations because those are the expensive operations in a program that are going to communicate potentially across a network. 
And so the programmer should be conscious of when they're writing communication. And so that, that's why we've stuck with this proxy thing rather than trying to kind of bury it all under the covers to um, you know, make it completely transparent. But even with that, you know, you're still just calling the exact method that you defined in your header and in the signatures. So, um, oh, question? Okay, yeah, so the, so the question was, are these asynchronous or synchronous methods? By default, they are asynchronous methods, and we will address this in more detail in the next two, three minutes. Um, so thank, thank you for leading in. <laughs> um, so what you may have noticed is that uh, our objects were all declared with void return types as written, or the methods were all declared with void return types. Um, so the reason for this is that, again, by default, you don't want to set something up that's going to require a response because that adds more overhead and more expense to the execution. So to see why this is the case, if by default you were to expect a return value, you would either need to set up a future, which you know some other systems do, uh, or you would need to actually block waiting for that response. And you could potentially run other work in that time that you're blocked, but there's still a cost to doing that. So if you, send, if you make a method call from A to B, you know, B will execute that method, and then the return value has to go back to A. And in that time, the processor running A might not be able to do other things, or might have to pay more overhead to be able to. Go ahead. Well, I understand the design decision. What happens if the remote call triggers an exception? Um, so the question was, what happens if the remote call triggers an exception? And the answer to that is this design predates exceptions being widely supported um, and so has never really been addressed in Charm++. I suspect you would throw back out to the runtime scheduler and uh, the system would decide your program is broken and shut down. Another question? Does design predate C++ 98? Yeah. Yeah. So as, as we showed in the history, this you know this was implemented starting in the early 90s. So exceptions didn't exist when some of this was developed. It's a question. question along the same lines, um, a little lower level. If instance B dies, say hardware failure, um, what's going to happen then with the runtime? Uh, what's the kind of failure model? Maybe you're going to address yeah. this later on. Um, a little bit, yeah, but we can answer briefly now. Um, so the question is, what happens if the hardware hosting instance B dies in the course of this method execution? Did I get that right? Yeah, so um, at the application level, depending on whether you're running with runtime fault tolerance enabled or not, either the application will just shut down, it'll notice that the node failed and it will die because you know a socket got closed or it stopped getting axe or whatever. Um, or if you're running with the runtime's fault tolerance support enabled, then it will notice the hardware died and start recovery. And in either case, this is transparent to the actual application objects. So the application can be written with a complete reliability assumption that method invocations will always succeed. Uh, Bryce, question? So, and this is just a quick one, but did, so are you, you saying you guys don't have any form of Oh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a sec. Yeah, the question was, do we have any sort of future or similar things? But the answer, the answer is yes, we do. Can yeah, we the can answer can is yes, see and you'll see, you'll see stuff in just a sec. Uh, you said you can recover by doing checkpoints or by just um, redistribute the tasks? So, the so the question was, you know, do we recover by checkpoints, task redistribution, or some other means? Um, the answer is we've got a number of different mechanisms in the runtime for handling faults. One of them is based on checkpoint restart and it's flexible in whether it does that to stable storage or to memory of other nodes within the system, which gets you much better performance. We also have more experimental implementations of message logging protocols that can avoid even the cost of rollbacks to checkpoints. And we'll discuss some of that in more detail later in the presentation. So other questions? No, okay. So basically, the, you know, the reasoning behind uh, preferring void returns for most remote method invocations is that it tends to encourage designs that 
have good performance that avoid or you know explicitly account for latency in remote computations and actually to make reasoning about correctness somewhat easier in that you your your effects are always localized within a method and whatever is happening remotely is going to finish at some point in the future but not necessarily you know you don't get into sequencing it, you know, you, you're encouraged to think more carefully about the sequencing issues rather than brushing them under the rug. So, um, so the basic design in Charm++ is that method invocations are generally asynchronous and don't expect to return a value directly. Um, and computations are driven by incoming data from messages and they're initiated by, you know, someone making these method calls across or within the system. Um, so the way this looks in practice on you know, our global collection of objects is that you have what look like these method calls and they're actually sending you know, messages to produce remote, asynchronous remote method invocation across, you know, across different objects in the global object space. And we call these, as mentioned earlier, entry methods. So methods that can be, you know, that act as entry points for parallel execution. Um, so the question was raised a little bit earlier of how you get return values. Um, there are a few ways to do it in the charm runtime system. One is with, as mentioned, futures, which you know, we've had since I think the late 90s built in. Um, and those are, again, remotely remotely functional, so you can take a future from something that's going to execute elsewhere. Uh, we also have en um, entry methods that can be run with certain attributes like synchronous, which means that the uh, caller actually will block waiting for a return, and the processor running the caller will suspend it and do something else until that return comes back. So basically it encapsulates the future in runtime and generated code so the application developer doesn't have to handle it explicitly. Um, and th so other ways that you can do it are actually just by having the object that you called call you back explicitly. If, if it's a closely coupled application and you know where the return value is going, you can write in kind of a continuation passing style where the thing that you called computes a response and then calls a method on you to tell you what that response is. And a final method for doing this is by callback objects where you construct, you know, an opaque object representing some method and some object to call that method on. And you pass that to a recipient. The recipient will do some computation and then pass the result to that callback, which will send a message to wherever the response is actually desired. Hmm? Yeah, so that, that can be used to implement libraries with looser coupling where you don't necessarily know in the library how the application wants to use it. Um, so now hand back to Ram for uh, yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be quick. Uh, okay, so we spoke about method invocations and objects. Uh, we also tried. We also try to make it easy to express uh, collective operations on collections of objects. Right. So. Uh, so this is the before, and technically that's the after. Uh, what I want to highlight here is these dotted lines, which actually represent collective addressing of objects. So, so Phil, when he was explaining, he mentioned these proxy objects, which, actually, which are actually stand-in local handles to, to remotely distributed objects. Uh, so if you, can, you can call a proxy, subscript it with the index, which specifies a given object and send a message or send a method, and that would be a point-to-point -point uh, point -point or a single method invocation. If you do not subscript it, uh, then you're actually calling for a broadcast on all the objects which are in that instance or in that collection, in that char array, that is. Uh, and that's represented here. So suppose this object just says b.m3. Uh, that's going to become a broadcast throughout the system, and it's going to call the method b, uh, it's going to call the method m3 on every instance of this array of b objects. Uh, so that's baked into the system. That makes it much easier to express parallel algorithms. Uh, you can very easily say, uh, so you say you have an, say you have an image computation. So you've got multiple tiles of the image. Uh, you can say, hey, image, invert your colors, and that just becomes one call, uh, or or whatever whatever image. I'm not a I'm not a graphics person, right? <laughs> uh, 
so you, you, can, you don't have to do this on the whole collection of objects. You can actually even pre-specify slices or, uh, or, or subsets of your object collection. Uh, say you have a matrix and you've decomposed your matrix into blocks. Uh, and now you want to do some computation on just one row of the matrix or one, one block of one column of blocks in the matrix. Uh, you can specify that subset uh, of objects that you want to compute on uh, and on the same proxy object again. So on the proxy object, you can say, I want a proxy uh, to just this subset of objects because I'm going to do some computation on just that one. Uh, and you can invoke methods on just that. Uh, so these, these are just basically productivity features that enables people to express their algorithms much more easily and clearly. Uh, so that's invocation on collections. Uh, so, so we did speak about macro data flow uh, and how, how these remote method invocations uh, will enable this kind of a data flow mechanism, right? Uh, so yeah, we have futures. That's one way of doing things. The design decision in Charm is that you do not return a value. It's a void, it's a void return type. Uh, so a method invocation then just becomes uh, a one-way transfer of information from the caller to the callee saying, hey, here's some data, do something with it, or here's a control signal, here's a trigger. Uh, I know these dependencies have been satisfied, and here you can now, you can now do something. I'm, I'm, I'm authorizing you to compute, or something like that, right? Uh, and uh, so it, it signals the application's intent to perform a possibly remote task, right? Uh, it, it carries yeah, invocations, invo entry methods carry all the required input data for the remote task. So, so if you have an entry method, then it's got everything. If you've got a method invocation, it's got everything that's required to actually rem trigger the method on the remote object. It's got the it's got the call. It's, it knows which function or which method to invoke. It's got all the required input parameters. So it's a completely self-contained package that you can send over, right? And uh, and this expresses parallel dependencies too. So so you don't have to think about is processor one computing on this part of the matrix. Now, should I send this message from processor one to processor five or 500 or whatever? You say, I'm computing on this block of my matrix. Uh, I know the output from this computation goes to some other matrix block. And I know that matrix block because that's my algorithm. It's not, I don't know which processor it lives on. And I, and I just express my dependencies based on these method invocations. Right, uh, back again. Um, so just to give you, you know, one view of how, how this works in a real application, here's a diagram of NAMD, which is a molecular, uh, classical molecular dynamics simulator. So the usual description of this is that it's just F, F equals MA with electrostatic interactions between, you know, individual atoms, which are models as point charges with, you know, some mass. Uh, so the implementation of NAMD is that it breaks up the problem across uh, several different kinds of objects. The first part of it is that there is a decomposition of the simulation space and the particles that reside in an individual space are assigned to what we call patch objects, which contain those particles and are responsible for maintaining their positions. And if a particle moves from the space of one patch to another, then the patches will communicate to indicate that, that the object has moved across the boundary. Um, so those patches primarily send their particle positions to other objects that are then going to compute forces on the particles. So the dominant calculation are what are called non-bonded forces. So just, you know, two nearby charges in, or two nearby particles interacting by how, how much charge they carry. Um, and the implementation of that is by these objects called computes. Uh, and computes are responsible for the forces generated by atoms in residing in pairs of patches that are nearby each other. So this embodies the fact that a good parallel algorithm for molecular dynamics doesn't need to compute force interactions for particles that are more than a cutoff distance apart from each other, or it uses a different technique rather than pairwise computation to come up with those forces. And so you only need these compute objects filled in for patches that are sufficiently close to each other in the simulation space to actually exist in the system. And so while the patch, the patch array would be a dense array of objects because your simulation space is you know, solid, um, the compute array is a much sparser collection that only, that only deals in nearby indexes. And then what happens is each patch multicasts the particles it owns to the computes that it interacts with, um, the particle positions 
to the computes that it interacts with. Those computes each generate forces for the interactions they're responsible for, sends them back via a reduction operation to the patch, and the patches sum those up, and when they receive all of their forces, they then integrate to move the particles forward in time to figure out how fast and how far they're moving. Uh, question? Are you using network layer multicast? Um, so the question is, what kind of multicast are we using? Um, so at the level that NAMD is written, this is a runtime level multicast, which says here are the objects that need to receive this message containing particle positions. Um, generally, the way that's implemented in the runtime is that we construct a tree over the processors that contain those recipient objects, because this is a multicast over a small subset of the objects in that compute collection. So we figure out what processors hold objects in that collection, build a tree over them, and send the message along that tree to move the data where necessary. And other parts of NAMD actually do use um, network layer primitives for doing many-to-many uh, -many and all-to-all -all exchanges for the FFT operations in the particle mesh walled computation. So the runtime does enable you to use very low-level hardware features where necessary for performance. But in general, the multicast, we actually do better optimizing over these runtime managed trees because then we can perform them asynchronously, managed by the runtime. So just to give you an example of you know, what NAMD is used for and the performance it gets, this is a visualization of a chromatophore, which is the photosynthetic organelle in some purple bacteria. Uh, what you're seeing here are proteins from, sur uh, from the surface of a membrane that are embedded in the surface of a membrane of that organelle. Um, and, the, and that's a system of 100 million atoms that was used to benchmark uh, the Blue Water system at NCSA for its acceptance tests by NSF. So uh, what we have here, okay, this is benchmark results for APOA1, which is a much smaller molecular system. Um, on blue gene machines at Argon. So we can see at, you know, starting at just 16 processors, we're running at 125 milliseconds per step, and we strong scale all the way out to uh, 794 microseconds per step at 64,000 processors. So that, so one step is a full cycle of broadcast positions, calculate forces, c send forces back, reduce them, and compute the integration of new positions. Question. Um, so that's an, uh, an average, um, I'm assuming, of the, the, the most the microseconds per step. Um, have you looked at the distribution? Is it, it no, so the, these steps, because of PME, have, and because there's data dependencies from one step to the next. Oh, the question was, are these an average of steps? Do you mean average across the run or across the objects within each step? What I mean is, does the first step, do the first Um, in NAMD, the first few hundred steps take longer than, oh, the question was, do the first several steps take longer than subsequent steps, and does step time decrease over time? In NAMD, the first few hundred steps will take somewhat longer than the rest, because we're doing setup and load balancing initially. After that, um, this is a steady state performance. So, you know, your first five minutes of execution actually probably first like 30 seconds of execution might be a millisecond or two per step before the runtime is settled in. And again, this is to settle in on 64,000 processors. And typically these runs take 4, 8, 12, 72 hours to go from start to finish. So that first few seconds to tune up are basically negligible. And this is, but this time reported is the average over the entire run including all of the setup steps. So um, we've also gotten performance for the 100 million atom system on some large Cray systems. Again, linear strong scaling down to uh, 9 microseconds per step or 13 microseconds per step with the PME calculation, which is milliseconds, sorry, um, which is you know remarkably strong scaled. And I think we need to speed up some because we're running out of time. So as mentioned earlier, uh, these remote method invocations turn into messages that the runtime system packs up and transmits for you. Could you keep the thing visible so I can see what's, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so, okay, it's yours. Yeah. Um, so we were, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so we spoke about method invocations in RMI. Um, under, under, under the covers, every RMI becomes a message, and that's how the runtime system delivers it uh, to the remote destination. Uh, so, so yeah, so what, what, what allows us to do better with these messages, right? So, so the fact that we have wide, wide return types and the fact that these messages express dependencies. Uh, so, so, so that allows us to say that when you, when you trigger a remote method invocation, you're just expressing the dependency. It's, it's not something that has to happen right away. It's just some, you're, you're just saying, you can execute this at this point. You're not saying you should execute this at this point. And that's, that's a primary difference between, between existing other older programming models, parallel programming models, where it's, it's almost like communicating sequential processes, right? So you, you have a process which is doing something, it's sending a message, and, and, and at that point, you actually say what has to happen at what time. Uh, you decouple that notion of when something should execute from when something can execute. The application programmer says when something can execute. He expresses the dependencies in the algorithm. And the runtime system figures out when something should execute. Right? So uh, also, so, so we, we spoke about RMI, uh, and we spoke about it being completely asynchronous. So what's to stop uh, multiple processors from sending remote method invocations to different objects that live on, on some, say, processor 500? Right, uh, it, it's completely possible, right? So what should what should execute at that point on on processor 500, say? Uh, so the natural way to fix uh, to to deal with that is to have a queue of messages, incoming messages, and and that's what that's what Chern++ does, and I think that introduced the first notion of a separation uh, of of application components from a runtime system and runtime system components. So we maintain a queue of messages uh, on each processor. These are incoming messages, and we pick messages from this to execute. There's a scheduler component which executes these, which picks messages from this queue. And the scheduler is basically the core engine that drives the execution in John++, uh, in, the, in the runtime system scenario. It is the one which is responsible for picking out messages from the queue, deciding what to execute, uh, and, and, and which core to execute it on in a, in a shared memory system. Right. Uh, so we spoke about objects. There's a fundamental unit of state. Methods are the fundamental unit of execution. Uh, methods are non-preemptible. Uh, they are scheduled for execution. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, for lack of time, I'm going to skip through to the end and then talk about all the points together, right? They're scheduled for execution. They are not preempted uh, in the sense you do not have interrupts. The runtime system does not interrupt the core when it is working on an entry, entry method. And that's why these are entry methods. They're entry points into the application's logic. And the application has to return control explicitly by saying, completing that function, completing that entry method, right? Uh, they are not reentrant, meaning if you have an object living on a, on a node, uh, it, it can only have one method ex executing it on, at any given time. You, could, cannot, you cannot have multiple methods on the same object at the same time. Uh, they have an unspecified delivery order, which, which means you, you send two method invocations from, process, from the origin. They're not guaranteed to execute in the same order on the, on the receiving end. Uh, this does complicate things a little bit in terms of expressing application logic, but I think it, it, it enables the runtime, empowers the runtime system to deliver more performance. When we, get, when, we do, when we say that you should not expect methods to be executed in the, or, in the order in which you're in, they are invoked. Uh, so applications have to express dependencies without explicitly depending on, on the order of message delivery. Right. Um, and methods do not require any threading or locking or such shared memory demons uh, to, get, to get performance out of, right? Uh, so should, should I just? Um, flip through that. So I did, yeah. Uh, I did. I did talk about execution. I did talk about out of order execution. Uh, so the scheduler is responsible for picking a message from this queue, uh, and which message should it pick? Normally, it's a FIFO queue or something. Uh, but you can have different ki ki kinds of computation, and you can prioritize which computation needs needs more preference or more priority over the other. If you're doing something really critical in the application, and you're also doing something that's less important for for getting immediate performance, but you have to do it eventually, you, you can prioritize the more important execution. So the messaging queue and the messaging system is, is a prioritized model. You can specify message priorities or method invocation priorities in the application. And the scheduler actually picks out in order of message priorities. So it's a prioritized queue. Uh, and that gives applications a lot of power in expressing which portions of the computation are really important and which portions of the computation need preference and need to get done first if your application has to perform well. So, so this whole kind of 
this whole kind of separation of concerns keeps coming in. Uh, the application programmer specifies, annotates the application algorithm or the methods or the objects or the priorities so that they can express or uh, parallelism in some good manner and the runtime system delivers that performance. Uh, maybe I'll, we should just skip yeah, over, I'll, right? I'll take right. it real quickly. Yeah. Um, so this is just a visualization from the Changa cosmology simulator. Um, it simulates gravity and smooth particle hydrodynamics across universe scale systems. Um, so this is kind of a zooming out view of the kind of things Chang is used for, from you know gas in a small region of space to stars in a galaxy to you know clusters and overall universe scale things. And the reason we show Chang'e here is because it, in its computation it has what's local work and remote work that will be invoked on the same sets of objects and the remote work has to take priority because remote objects have called for it and are depending on the answers to it and so we prioritize execution to favor remote work and the scaling that results in notice this is node count so 64 processes per node again we can get very ex efficient execution out of Chunga. yes yeah, so that's um, 32,000 processors at the far right end um, so just as a recap of what we've seen so far, you can express you know, any kind of parallelism with, within objects, data parallelism, task parallelism, and so forth. Um, the number of objects you want to create is independent of the number of processors in your system. And then that leaves us with the next question of how big are th should these objects be? How many objects should you have? Um, and so the answer to that is that we generally want several objects per processor, which we call over decomposition. And the reason for this is that it means you'll get much better utilization of your hardware. So when you have multiple objects on a processor, it increases the chances that w at least one of them will have work available for the processor to actually execute. It also means that you can overlap communication with, of one object with computation of another. You can be sending or receiving data over the network while the processor is actually executing something in an unrelated object. And additionally, the over decomposition is very important for subsequent optimizations that we're going to do in the runtime system. So just as an example of this, there's the BROM's weather simulation code. It's research and forecasting use in Brazil. And it shows, you know, very dramatic variation in the load it presents across the simulation area because where there are you know storms of various sorts particularly where there's rain falling there's a lot more computation to perform um, so you can either if you have four processors for instance you can either do this very coarse decomposition of BROMs where you have just one object per processor or you can break it up into many more objects and that has very pr important performance implications so with the one-to-one uh, -one decomposition of BROMs, you get you know, this kind of utilization where the average is about 44%, which means that 56% uh, of the time in your system is just being spent with the processor's idle. When you over-decompose, you can see the processor utilization goes up dramatically. The average is now around 72 or 73%. And we'll see further results that make that even better a bit later in the talk. So, the other part of considering how to construct your object is the grain size that they'll produce. And those of you who saw Hartmut's talk earlier in the day will have seen the same kind of graph where you have this bathtub shaped curve where at the low end of your grain size, where that's the amount of work that an object is going to execute in one entry method invocation, at the low end overhead dominates the actual computational work. And then you have this broad sweet spot where you have enough work to do to amortize all of the overhead and get good performance. And then at the high end, where your grain size is too long, that means that you don't expose enough parallelism and one processor will be continuing work in one chunk while other processors are sitting idle. And so that one chunk will then be the limiting factor for your overall performance, equivalent to an Amdahl's Law bottleneck, even though you are actually executing in parallel. Um, so, the next thing that we get out of you know, this virtualized, over-decomposed execution model is modularity and composability. So, as you, some of you may have experienced, it's difficult but possible to write you know, parallel code with different components interleaved in the source in order to uh, run multiple things at the same time. It's possible to break up your execution in time or space to you know, compose things without trying to interleave them. But 
if you want to seamlessly interleave two different parallel modules, you need some something that will let you uh, run both pieces of them you know, overlapping with each other without them having to be tightly coupled to each other and a virtualized runtime system provides exactly that. Um, so, uh, so you either keep the abstraction to get performance, uh, so you either keep the abstraction and lose performance or you get performance and break abstractions. You cannot actually compose and, and Charm lets you do that. Uh, yeah, so separate object collections can overlap perfectly well because whatever entry methods get invoked um, the runtime system will deliver them and won't won't bother one object with the work of another so here's wait, yeah is this yeah. yours okay uh, yeah, this point so you just just like stuff. Yeah. Um, okay so 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 I think throughout the talk so far we've been talking about a separation of concerns between between the application developer and the runtime system uh, there's more to this uh, uh, there's so so you you can actually cleanly set uh, so Lots of this stuff is actually very obvious in sequential code, and, and it's, it's, it's beaten to that, and people really know this well. Uh, in parallel code, achieving this is somewhat more difficult. Uh, in actual large-scale distributed parallel programs, uh, so you can, have, you can have layering in your, or layering or separation of components in your application. Uh, the logic, application logic, or the compute kernels, the parallel algorithm, the application performance tuning code, as well as the runtime services, they're all separate, they can be separated. Uh, you can also have, uh, Different people working on different portions of it with 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 a, with a clean separation of roles. Uh, so I think Charm or or or, or a run or a runtime based object based uh, uh, parallel programming system actually lets you do that uh, very very efficiently. Uh, so uh, so this is one example. Actually, I'm not. I think I'm going to like kind of wash through all of it. Uh, so basically. You, we, we've spoken about object collections. We've spoken about remote method invocations. But who specifies where these objects have to live? Uh, which processors have to host which, proce uh, which objects? Uh, so we, we, we permit that pretty efficiently in Charm, uh, where it's completely decoupled from the application logic. So the domain expert could just write the domain code and not worry about where the objects live. And then somebody else who's, who cares about performance, who is a tuning expert, can go in and say, hey, if I want good performance, I want these rows, these rows of the matrix to live on these processors, or these styles of the image to live on some set of processors. Uh, and that's, so, so that's, uh, this is actually real code that we took out from an LU factorized, uh, a numerical linear algebra example. Uh, that we actually ran on 8,000 cores or something. Uh, so the application logic was completely separated, and that is all we needed to do to specify where the object should live to get good performance. Uh, so you just specify, it's, it's basically like uh, you write a standard hash. So this, this stuff is, uh, this stuff has anal an 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 analogies or analogs in modern C++. So this is like writing your own standard hash. hash. So when the runtime system says, hey, I have this object with this index, where should I put it? So it's basically like a hash function so that says, okay, this is the processor you need to put it on. Uh, it's just older syntax that comes from 90s, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, we already spoke about open item. I'm gonna skip through. Uh, the same the same mechanism allows us to actually decompose something really large and really huge. This is this is several hundred thousand lines of code. This application, uh, and we can write the mapping or how the objects are placed completely separately uh, on large supercomputer interconnect networks, which have like mesh tori uh, or fat tree clusters or something like that. Uh, and 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 that separation also gives us good performance improvements because then the application specialist knows what he's doing and can do that independent of the application. Um, Separation of concerns also means layered responsibility, which means uh, the application worries about expressing logic and the runtime worries about getting performance, right? So we're gonna talk more about that in the next sections. I think we're gonna really speed through that stuff. Uh, but maybe, are there any questions or are we just like smothering you in slide after slide uh, of content, right? Okay, you want me to just take it from here? I yeah, just go. Yeah. Okay. Because so, um, go, just go to migrate yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Forget the lookup completely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll skip through. So we were going to go over a little bit of implementation details of how we do uh, object location. If you want to hear about that, we'll talk. We'll be glad to talk to you after the session. But it seems we don't really have time to go into too much detail on that. The important upshot from it, though, is that the application code is oblivious. You know, at, at the application logic level, is oblivious to where the recipient of a message lives, and it just fires off the method invocation and lets the runtime deliver it. Um, so, uh, the next uh, thing that we want to cover, which is kind of the 
defining feature of the runtime services that Charm++ provides is all based on object migration. So the application is written in terms of this collection of interacting objects, and then those objects are distributed across the system somehow, and the application can say how it wants it distributed, and it can also ask the runtime to try to optimize that to get better results. Um, so the reasons that you might want to move objects around from where they're initially instantiated are, uh, there are several of them. So one of them is fault tolerance, as was brought up before, that um, if a node is lost in the system, you might want to reinstantiate the objects that lived on that node someplace else in the system. Another reason to migrate objects would be to produce better communication locality. So if you're running a dynamic uh, application, you can observe what the ob the runtime can observe what the objects are doing, which ones are interacting, and then migrate them so that heavily interacting objects are on the same node or are on nearby nodes within the network. Um, a dominant reason that you would perform migration is to produce better load balance in the system. So you want to uh, help overloaded processors by moving work, moving objects that are doing too much work off of them to less loaded processors. And finally, we might want to migrate objects to uh, produce, uh, to provide power, energy, or heat management by adjusting the workload of individual processors. So the way we achieve this is that application code provides serialization routines which tell the runtime what it has to do to migrate each object, and then the runtime does everything else involved with that. Um, so here's an example of one of the serialization routines. Um, here's a class description, and there's the code that you write to serialize it. We use a framework implemented in Charm++ called PUP, which is short for Pack Unpack. Um, the syntax for it is fairly simple. For each member field that you want to pack up, you just pass it to this popper object, you know, you pipe it to it. That was the, the operator kind of conceit that we used there. Uh, question? Can Quickly. Can you um, serialize derived classes from base pointers? Yeah. Um, so the question was, can you serialize derived classes from ba base pointers? And the answer is yes, we have mechanisms to do that in the PUP framework. Uh, it's just not shown on the slide here. Um, so uh, once you have, so basically the separation of concerns here in providing an introspective adaptive runtime system is that the application is all worried about the domain logic and the parallel algorithm that it wants to express. And then the runtime system is all about the execution resources, the processors, the network, the nodes, and so forth. So the runtime system watches what each object is doing, how it's using the available resources, which include you know, execution time on the CPU, how it's using the network, how sensitive each object or each entry method even is to processor frequency, and potentially performance counters of CPUs, memory, network, and so forth. Um, so it records this information and then lets other pieces of infrastructure like the load balancer tracing frameworks and so forth use that information. So it'll then invoke adaptation mechanisms at appropriate intervals and adjust object placement or scheduling policies or CPU frequencies or whatnot accordingly. Um, so here's an example of load imbalance where we have one processor that's doing way more work than all the others. The white line is showing idle time on those processors. And this is a screenshot from our projections tool, which you know, ships right alongside the uh, runtime. It provides a number of different analysis techniques. You've actually seen some graphs from projections earlier in the talk as well, when we were talking about BROMs and its utilization. So uh, load balance as the, the issue of load balance is essentially that performance in an application that has some synchronization or an iterative structure is limited by the most heavily loaded processor that's going to take the longest to finish a step. And the, uh, the causes of load imbalance vary pretty widely. Um, and the response that the runtime provides has to match the causes, the applications, other concerns like communication locality, and the scale of the system. So here is what we saw with BROMs earlier when we over decomposed it. When you actually run it with an appropriate load balancing strategy, here's the result that you get, where your average utilization is around 88% up from uh, low 70s, and so the overall time gets, the overall execution time gets much better. Um, another application that heavily uses load balancing is an adaptive mesh refinement benchmark that we've worked on. 
Um, and the load in this application actually changes fairly gradually because we've, in, we've developed mapping techniques that ensure that newly instantiated objects are spread nicely over many processors. And so load will only incrementally grow over time. And we can thus use a very lightweight, low information load balancing strategy to produce dramatically better performance and nearly linear scaling out to uh, tens of thousands of processors. Um, let me just run with it. Okay, yeah, so just one note about um, our load balancing system is that, uh, you know, you might wonder how often should the load balancer run, when should it run, and the basic answer is that it should be when the imbalance is actually hurting your application for performance. So in this program, you can see that early on in execution, processor utilization is very low, and yet the first time the load balancer runs is all the way over here. So we've recently implemented in the latest release of Charm what we call the meta balancer, which you activate just by passing this plus meta LB argument at runtime and it automatically determines how often the load balancing system should run. And when run with the same application with meta LB, it sees that very early on in this application's run, the load is changing very, very rapidly. And so the load balancer runs frequently to keep utiliz utilization of the overall system very high. And then once the application's pr behavior stabilizes, the load balancing frequency, which are these downward white spikes while the load balancer runs, become much less frequent. Uh, saving you the overhead of load balancing and migrating objects too often. Um, another reason that you might want to hold off on load balancing is because migration might be expensive. This is the case in BROMs, where generally weather codes are written to fill up the entire memory of a system. So migration could actually be, you know, a second or two per object. So you actually want the load balancing system to decide when migration is profitable even if you are currently badly imbalanced, migration might actually be worse than what it's costing you to keep running. Question? Does the load balancing analyze the communication behavior between the objects? Yes. So the question was, does the load balancing analyze communication behavior between objects? And the answer is that it depends. So the load balancers in Charm++ are plug-in strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure collects the communication graph between objects optionally. Um, so you can decide if you want that, that data recorded or not. And then some load balancing strategies store or actually account for that communication inf information that it's been given. So another reason that you might want migration is to manage power, energy, and heat. Um, and this, was, this is the subject of ongoing research in our group. Um, so basically, there are a lot of benefits you can get from um, managing power, energy, and heat in a parallel system well, which is, you know, you reduce direct costs of execution, the machine energy and the cooling energy that you consume from the beginning to end of execution. You can also reduce capital costs if you're, you know, the DOE and you're building a data center to house the computer that will run your simulations for the next five years. You want to be able to spec it to exactly as much as you need and not, you know, twice or three times what you need. Um, keeping temperatures low can actually improve reliability. There's a fairly well-established um, formula which is, says that 10 degrees Celsius of device temperature uh, can double or have the failure rate of silicon electron of sil silicon semiconductors. Um, and if you're dealing with you know embedded systems or even you know a personal laptop or workstation, you can improve user experience by managing this well by keeping fan noise low at low temperatures, reducing ambient heat, like your phone in your pocket, um, and improving battery life. So these are just a few plots of how the mechanisms in the runtime have improved what we can do over a naive DVFS temperature limiting strategy. Um, basically, it's the green line comes to the red line. All of these are have saved energy for the overall course of execution. This includes both the machine and the cooling systems in the machine room that it ran. Um, and there with that the cost of varying amounts of um, runtime overhead ranging from 14% all the way down or from 24% and the worst possible choice of parameters down to uh, 3% or 1%. Question back there? Go ahead, yeah. Um, was not too long ago that, that my best assessment was that 
both synchronous and parallel was a good way to, to do these kind of massive computations. Um, and I was thinking about, so what's the, what's the fundamental difference? Why don't you need that? Well, it's clear it's because you don't have, you don't have any return values, right? So you never have to wait for an answer back. There's no need for synchronization. Um, so the question was, how do you get away from, you know, bulk synchronous style of execution and the constraints that impose? I haven't asked the question yet. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was just background to the question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, uh, assuming I've got all of those base assumptions right, my question is, how does this affect the programming model? I think about your, you know, simulation of particles where they affect each other in different spaces, and I don't see how you can avoid waiting to hear from certain things about what happened in the previous step. At least, at, you know, you might have to buffer things, but at some point you need to, you need to get the answers for that step, don't you? Um, so the question is, how do you avoid synchronization when you have data dependencies on, you know, data on results computed by someone else? Is that essentially I, it? I guess so. I, don't I, I mean, the, the end... The, the answer to that question is that we boil the synchronization in the program down to just the data dependencies and avoid synchronizing on other, other things that happen to be going on that are irrelevant to continuing execution. Okay, so um, maybe we should take this offline because this was kind of covered earlier in the talk. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I think from here... We've got, yeah, a few more application results, and then we'll just wrap up. So uh, do we want to? No, I'm just going to skim through. Uh, okay. So, uh, so I think we're almost out of time, so there's no point going into more results. But this is a graph application that you were asking about. You guys don't have, you can, you know. <laughs> well, we don't want to run. Yeah, we don't, yeah, we'd, we'd rather, we yeah, we'd, we'd, yeah. Uh, so you were talking about a graph application. This is a graph application. It's actually... Uh, a social network and how information or disease or something spreads in social networks. Uh, and this is this is some cool visualization of the whole US population that they simulated or something. And uh, that, that ran on like 300,000 cores uh, on Blue Waters, uh, which, is, which is back home uh, in the town that we live in. Uh, more results. This is just proof that we also do shared memory systems. It's not always just large distributed systems. Uh, this is uh, a KD tree construction. It's a, it's a it's a graphics. It's it's used in graphics for ray tracing and things like that. Um, and we're we're comparing against uh, one of the best known implementations of this that used Intel threading milling blocks. Um, and they had a paper about this. Uh, and we compared against that version. And the dotted lines are their implementations, and the solid lines are our implementations. Uh, just to say that we are competitive even in the shared memory regime, right? Uh, yeah. And it got a bit. This got a best paper award a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is dense numerical linear algebra, uh, so LU factorization, matrix computation kind of things, and we're scaling that to 8,000 cores. Uh, we didn't scale it beyond that because this takes a lot of compute cycles to actually get these data points. Uh, so at that point, we're actually just starved of resources. Uh, we probably have spoken about projections, and since we're kind of out of time, we'll just go through cool pretty pictures and say pretty pictures and then wind up with that saying, uh, we've got a pr performance visualization and analysis tool. We collect traces, execution traces during execution, and we use these to analyze performance and optimize. And, and because asynchrony is sometimes not really, bulk synchrony is kind of very easy to reason about, but bulk synchrony also doesn't give you great performance. If you want to use asynchrony to get better performance, then you need, the, you need powerful analysis tools to back that up. Uh, so we can look at performance over time. Uh, we can look at which processors are the rogue processors which are delaying the whole computation. We can try to identify, so this is the average load and these are the extremely overloaded processors. And we can try to decide what to do about them, maybe move objects away from them or something. Uh, these, are, these are execution traces uh, across different processors and, and we've, we've had to do this at, at scale basically to kind of optimize applications. Uh, that is communication over time for all processors. You can li look at how many bytes are sent or received, whether some nodes have network bandwidth limitations or latency issues or... Message counts also. Yeah, message counts too. Uh, and we actually have a debugging tool uh, because if, 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 you, if you write a different programming model 10 years ago when nobody uh, was really talking about these issues, then you have to develop your own tool chain to do these things. Uh, and so we did. And 
so we have a debugger and it, it's fairly useful. Um, that's a screenshot. Uh, and, and we'll recap with that. Uh, that's actually the Charm Plus Plus homepage. And I thought it was, I didn't have the time to actually write this content onto a slide, so I just took a screenshot. Um, <laughs> so I think those are the key points, that we deal with migratable objects, uh, we, we ask for asynchronous, we provide asynchronous methods, and underneath that we provide an adaptive runtime system that completely adapts, observes execution and adapts to situation to give better performance. And uh, as a result, we can provide all these capabilities, we provide overlap, we hide your computer communication costs, we provide load balancing, we provide checkpointing, so you kill a process, you pull the plug on a machine, it will continue to run. We provide fault tolerance. Uh, we, we think, you know, the code is pretty portable. We showed you the list of architectures that we run on. And that's, that's a sweet uh, benefit. It, it's, it's, it's actually a painful benefit. Uh, because when you have users and you have to support portability, then you really cannot evolve your API any longer that quickly or that easily. Uh, and so our API is kind of, uh, we, were, we were aggressive in the 90s. Before the C++ standard in the mid 90s, we had objects and object-based decomposition and everything. And it kind of like, after that, we become more gradual. We've not adopted the modern C++ 11 standards or something because, because that wouldn't run on all the machines that our users run on. Um, and I'll probably stop there for questions. Okay. And that's a graph of what the capabilities are and what that enables. So any questions? Sorry, I came very, very late. Uh, how is this related or is it to MPI? Uh, Here, I'll, I'll I would that. say it's an alternative. MPI would be a very bulk synchronous communicating sequential processes kind of approach. Uh, so you have multiple processes. Oh, okay, the question is, how is this related to MPI or how does this compare to MPI? Uh, MPI is the de facto standard for parallel programming. Uh, but uh, the, the notion there is you divide your, part, your partition your work into communicating sequential processes. You say what each processor has to do. Uh, here, in, instead, you express your algorithm in terms of objects and methods, independent of the number of processors that you are running on or that you have to work on. Uh, and you let the runtime system adapt uh, execution to give you better performance. That's a very crude and short answer. Uh, maybe yeah, so just as an analogy, you, you might say that MPI provides you know, a solid foundation you know, just above the ground that you, you can put up the house that is your application on top of it. Charm++ provides more of a skyscraper of runtime services and your application is then just, you know, the sparkling spire at the very top of it. You know, so you, you can get a lot higher with the tooling that we, you know, MPI provides very okay. rudimentary, you know, basic foundational facilities. Charm++ goes, you know, builds a much taller thing on top of that. MPI and is a library for messaging communication primitives. It provides you primitives for communication across processors. This is a framework which, which allows you to express parallel algorithms better and provides a runtime system to yeah. optimize performance. And just for note, we can run on top of MPI. We also have an MPI implementation on top of Charm. So, and we can also interoperate with MPI programs. So you can switch between MPI program and Charm program and back within the same job, within the same process even. Um, other questions? Yeah. yeah uh, are there any, um, let's say, helper libraries such as uh, Spots Matrix libraries and so on? Uh, the question. Because for me, it's a major limitation if I'm not able to solve any system. So the question was, are there helper libraries like uh, sparse matrices that would be useful in solving problems like uh, sparse linear systems? Um, so the answer is we have frameworks for a few kinds of common parallel applications. We don't currently have good frameworks for matrix computations right now. We just have a few benchmarks and other things like that. We're looking at building higher level tooling for that kind of thing as well you know, in the near future. Yeah. And we're happy to, you know, work with people who are interested in building things like that. Yeah, the, yeah, the cheeky answer would be, please help us build them, right? <laughs> because we, we think this framework, framework is cool, uh, but, but we, we also have lots of applications and demo use cases, but we, we hope it gets adopted. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is available online. You could go to charmplusplus.org. Uh, that's the homepage, and uh, it's available for download. It's available for testing. It's a free, non-commercial research license, um, and the license actually predates uh, OSL or Boost Open Source licenses or something. We're trying to get that fixed and make it an actual, official, ac acceptable open source license. Uh, but but feel free to test it, evaluate it, contribute. Yeah. Um, the more inquiries we get about licensing, the more pressure we can put to get the license changed. 
So if you want to use it, speak up. Um, yeah. Yes. Do you know of any commercial applications where people have actually used it? Because if I show um, this to some, some people, the first thing they'll ask is, uh, how much can we say? Uh, we we have we do we do have three or four uh, commercial organizations which are using or trying evaluating this. Um, I sh probably shouldn't say more, uh, okay. yeah. but I can I can talk to you yeah. after that. I mean, but yes, at least two of them are definitely yeah. under NDA, and one of them is. Yeah, and and it's explicitly NDA. available for uh, prototyping if 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 you're a commercial organization and and. So, so we can point out that it's an established system. It's been under sustained development for 15 years. It's not going away. Right. And, and, and one, one more thing we'd probably like to add is, this is a community of library developers and people who live on the cutting edge of the language and probably even define the cutting edge, right? Uh, so so this, is, this, is, this is an interaction that we've probably not attempted before. Uh, we come from a very traditional HPC system, and once we gained the large user base, we had to be very conservative in the way we evolved our APIs. Uh, so, so there are plenty of things that can be experimented with in terms of library uh, design or API designs or maybe even compilers or language techniques. Uh, and uh, maybe that kind of interaction might be something interesting, and we're trying to explore that during this visit. Right. Um, any, any other questions? Great. Well, with that, I guess we'll...